Hey, it's Beth. Before we get started, I wanted to give you a quick heads up that between minutes 20 and 30 today, we have a discussion about how the Me Too movement intersects with the evangelical culture. We always want to respect the different places that we're in when we're listening to a podcast. And if that would be a tough headspace for you today, you might just want to skip that part. Thanks for listening. This is Sarah Stewart Holland. And this is Beth Silvers. Thank you for joining us for Pantsu Politics. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Pantsuit Politics. Today, we are going to share our recent conversation with Kristen Cobas Dumay, the New York Times bestselling author of Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Kristen is a professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University. We met her on a speaking gig at Calvin. Again, we make the best connections on these trips. And we knew we would absolutely have to have her on this show. Y'all, this book, if you have not read it, picks up so many important threads, puts them together and says, this is how we got to Donald Trump, you guys. And it feels like all these missing pieces, all these questions, um, she just answers them. And the history is impeccable. Like, she is just telling stories that even as a person who grew up in the white evangelical church, I didn't understand and had not heard. And that's why we wanted to have her on here, because she she really fills in and expands the story in a way that is incredibly helpful. Yeah, she takes you through Oliver North and Promise Keepers and mm-hmm. Billy Graham, and you're just following this path that makes the past few years in American politics feel less like an earthquake and more like the logical extension of what we had been building towards. So this is a really helpful conversation, and I can't strongly enough recommend her book if you're still having that feeling of, like, how did we get here? She really puts the pieces together in a way that doesn't have anything to do with economic precarity or the other types of explanations that have been offered up for understanding where the Republican Party is today. Before we dive into that conversation, we are booking speaking events for next year. We're filling out our calendar, and we wanted to share a little bit about what we speak on and how we speak at these events. Um, We were in Oklahoma City last week. We did one talk on our new book, Now What?, and one talk on our old book. I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. But we always get as quickly as we can to the question and answer portion, because that's where we find we can do the most good. What we are really talking about in these speaking events is communication. Sometimes we use politics as the example. Sometimes we're talking about family relationships. Sometimes we're talking about workplace difficulties. But I feel like no matter the theme of the speech The message we're trying to convey and the tools we're trying to give to people are how to let people feel heard and how to be heard themselves, especially post-COVID. Some of that has broken down in real ways and people are in pain. And that that's why we love doing this, because it feels like we're getting out there. We're listening to people. We're, you know, trying to help with everything from we had somebody ask, how do I see to point to my teenager when they've really proved it? (laughs) To, I want to know my sister better, and she doesn't want to talk about this stuff, and I want her to know me, and I want to know her. So how do we bridge that divide? We've spent time with companies who are struggling with communication and connection because so many people are working remotely now. And we Mm -hmm. try to talk in very specific ways about what do you do if conflict surfaces while everybody's on Zoom and you can't really feel the vibe in the room? How do you navigate those situations? I think our speaking is so different from most speaking because there are two of us. So we're always in conversation with each other. We're bringing our different personalities to the table, our different life experiences experiences, our different work histories. And so we're able, I think, to really connect with almost everyone in the room because 
at least something from one of us touches on a, a real experience or a real need that's being expressed in the room. And that's what's fun for me. We're never doing the same presentation twice. Yeah. It always has its own energy. I learn something every time we speak. Even though I could tell all of Sarah's anecdotes at this point and she could tell mine, something new is drawn out every time we're out doing this. And it really enriches my thinking and we can tell from the Q&A how much trust is built in a short period of time because people are very vulnerable and honest with us. And I hope that we're giving them actionable takeaways when they leave. Yeah, that's what made me so proud when we were in Oklahoma. Shanna said, you know, you feel like you're getting something very valuable because it's not just a TED Talk that the kids could watch on the Internet and it would be the same. Nothing we do in any location is the same from a speech that we have done or a talk that we have done in another location because that's why we like spending time in these communities too is because we draw on our conversations with state legislators. We draw on our experiences at the First American Museum when we're making connections and trying to answer people's questions and give them some skills and some even language to use in their own communication environments is what I will say. So really, we're really, really proud of the work we do on the road, and we would love to come to your community. So if you're interested in bringing us to your organization or your university, please reach out to Elise at hello at pantsuitpoliticsshow.com. There's links in the show notes. You can reach out and DM. However you want to get in contact with us, we would love to hear from you. And I hope that section reads as much like a thank you note as a commercial. We want to make really clear what we do because we would like to bring it to spaces where it's needed. We also want to say that all of this is fun and exciting and interesting for the same reason that making the podcast is because you make it so because every person who shares their thoughts and time with us, especially when we're able to do that in person, makes us better at what we do and better thinkers and and better humans. So thank you for always being part of just that on ongoing building of this community. Up next, our conversation with Christian Kobus dunmay Christian Kobus dunmay welcome to Fancy Politics. Thank you. And you said my name so beautifully. That's like the best Thank I've you. heard. Oh, God, you you don't even know. I love a ribbon. That just, that we are on a really good start right now. This is a perfect Absolutely. start. Oh, okay. Your book, Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Boy, do you have good timing. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Ooh. Excellent timing. I mean, you're out there, you're naming this. I'm going to use the word trend very loosely here because I feel like you were illuminating this trend And then all this polling came out and said, hey, you know what? Evangelical is more an identity than it is a religion. But I'm I'm saying trend because what you illuminate in your book is that it's not not really a trend. It's sort of been the name of the game from the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. No. And and I was I was tracking this. I started the research that went into this book more than 15 years ago. And, you know, before that, I'd been paying attention. And so honestly, when I was writing the book, it just felt almost cathartic to get it all on paper Mm -hmm. and to say, you know, as I was watching things unfold on the national scene, I just kept thinking, I can explain this. I think I can explain this. And so (laughs) it it actually, I I worried it was going to be too late. And yet the wave has not yet crested. I'm not sure if and when. Oh, no, don't. No. Oh, no. Or maybe it has. Maybe it has. We won't know. We won't know until we're on the other side. Okay. 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 Let's go with the second one. Let's go with the second one. (laughs) I would prefer the second one. Well, I think it's really helpful that you open the book that way with a definition of evangelical. So can you lay that foundation for this conversation? When you when we say evangelical in this discussion, what are we talking about? Yeah, what I'm not talking about is how most scholars had defined the term, and that is as a theological identity, right? So and there's a kind of traditional way of describing it that evangelicals are Bible-believing Christians. They uphold the authority of the scriptures. They emphasize crucicentrism, the centrality of the cross, conversionism, this born-again experience, and then activism. So they're acting out of these faith commitments. And when I was looking at my research, I just came to the realization that that doesn't really describe what I'm seeing. I don't actually offer a definition of evangelicalism. I think there's something kind of ahistorical about that because evangelicalism or what we call evangelicalism changes so dramatically Mm. over the centuries. 
And so I'm just trying to describe what we're seeing when we look at people who are calling themselves evangelicals, identifying as evangelicals, and then these categories that pollsters will identify as evangelicals, really from World War II era to the present. And so when I look at that movement, I do see it as not primarily a group of people defined by theological doctrine but rather it's a social and cultural movement. And in many ways, I think it's helpful to understand it as a consumer culture, Mm -hmm. as a people united and shaped by the products they consume, Christian radio, Christian publishing, right? That there's, and so it's not really, are you a real evangelical or fake evangelical by name only? It's how deeply have you been immersed in this consumer culture in this world of evangelicalism? How much has that shaped your values? And then I go and say, well, what are some of those values? And let's look at what people are consuming and what they are actually embracing and identifying with. Why are evangelicals such good marketers? Why do you see this adopting the media, be it magazines, radio, TV? There's a real skill there. And it is a Definitely a through line that you see of this group taking advantage of new media, new markets, yes. and really embracing that consumer culture. Why? 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 Wow. Austin, why? That's such a good question. We can honestly spend an hour exploring that. Uh, we won't, but uh, this is a they, podcast. We can do whatever we want. Go ahead. <laughs> so there are all sorts of things that kind of feed into this. I mean, one of which is just the evangelism, right? This evangelism at the heart right. of. So unlike many denominational Christians or kind of, you know, church-oriented Christians, they're out there to to promote their brand. They're out there to convert. They're out there to get the word out and to draw people in. And so marketing is a huge part of that. Uh, You want to make your product look good. You want to show people that they have a need for it. You want to draw people in. And so evangelicals have, for more than a century, been really, really good at kind of branding, at selling a product. And that, what is the product? You know, evangelicals will say, it's, it's salvation. It's God's truth. It's the gospel. That's what we're selling. You know, other observers might say, you know, you, you know, you're you're really just bolstering your own power. You're selling your own product. You're, you know, you're benefiting off of this and you're you're trying to control others. So different interpretations there. But if you go back to 1942, it's an interesting moment. That's when we have the foundation of the National Association of Evangelicals. And they come together and they're looking around and saying, okay, you know, after the, the Scopes trial and so on, um, we lost control or weren't able to take control of many mainline denominations. They didn't disappear. They were doing really good work, but in little isolated places. So Bible colleges, and they started their own churches, their own small denominations. And so they came together in 1942 and said, imagine what we could do if we banded together. So strength in numbers. And when we come together, then we aren't just doing these good things all, you know, in in little, little places, but We can have organizations that link these Bible colleges together, and we can have magazines with subscribers in the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands, and we can have Christian publishing, and we can have bookstores in every town across this country and think about the good work we could do then, right? This is in 1942, and it was just amazing going back and reading that and realizing that within like 15 years or so, they had accomplished all of that. (laughs) They did it, and they are still doing it. Well, is some of this, we just interviewed Colin Woodard about American nations, and he talks about sort of these regions. And I wonder if some of this is just, just, I mean, we're definitely going to get into the American nationalism. And some of it is so distinctly American. You know, you look back on further back Christian history, you see a lot of nationalism, like a lot of just we're battling about ethnic identities. You come to America, especially in the 19th century, 20th century, and you have this fertile ground where, well, we're not talking about, at least not up front, an ethnic identity. Right. So we're, there's this there's this ability to take on another type of identity. And I think you could definitely make the case that American identity is definitely a consumer identity more than, you know, sort of Europe or other parts of the world. Do you think that that is this distinctly American, American piece of the puzzle? It is. It has a very American flavor to it, certainly. But then what we see happening and has been happening for a long time is this is being exported globally, yeah. too. And so you can find, I mean, since since Jesus and John Wayne came out, first I had, I had toyed with having a final chapter on the global reach of this uh, this Jesus and John Wayne Christianity. And 
I decided I didn't have time, space. It was just too big of a project to squeeze into a, a chapter. Uh, but since the book came out, I have heard from Christians in so many parts of this world, uh, in China and in Australia and in the Netherlands and in Brazil, especially Brazil, Brazil. in Kenya, right? That this is being exported. It has been through this consumer culture, through Christian radio, through Desiring God materials and the Gospel Coalition, and they are consuming this. And so it, it is very much a global movement. Wow. So talking about the effectiveness of marketing, I think leads us perfectly into a conversation about masculinity, because as I'm reading your book, masculinity feels like both the chicken and the egg to me. Like maybe this was part of what made it such effective marketing, but at some point it became the, the product itself. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, masculinity. So, so this this book was originally just, I conceived it as a book on white evangelical masculinity and militarism. And, and then um, down the road, my publisher said that both the words masculinity and militarism were too big to have in the title. So... <laughs> <laughs> I scratched that, but that's really you know what this is about. And and my attention really was drawn to this entire subject area by some of my students at Calvin University, a Christian university where I teach uh, in the early 2000s, actually, they drew my attention to this literature on Christian manhood. That was all the rage. Like, we're talking selling millions of copies a book, right? And uh, this, and, and I thought, okay, that's that's really interesting. When I read this, it was a very militant conception of masculinity, of Christian manhood. And what struck me immediately was that it really wasn't very biblical. For all their talk of being Bible believing Christians, uh, there weren't a lot of Bible verses in these books. Uh, instead, they were drawing on popular culture, mm. on symbol, on myth. And uh, they loved cowboys and warriors and soldiers and uh, William Wallace for the movie Braveheart. And yes, yes, John Wayne kept popping up. And so right, it becomes this kind of thing where, where they're drawn to this imagery, not out of a, arguably, out of a real biblical place, and then embrace the symbolism, then use that to, in a sense, kind of refashion their biblical teaching, what they see in the scriptures, their theology, so that Jesus himself, the Jesus of the gospels, which, you know, traditionally gentle Jesus, meek and mild kind of thing, love your neighbor as yourself, gets transformed into this ruthless warrior Christ. So to follow that Christ is to not take up your cross, but really take up your sword. Well, and I feel like what you do so well is, you know, when you're living a moment like that, when you're when you're watching this ebb and flow of masculinity, it feels like the first time it's happened, right? It feels like, oh, this is it. This is, you know, this is the first time they've really leaned into this militancy. Right. And then the way you track it back, because when I was growing up, I definitely grew up in the, sort of the promise keepers, mm -hmm. George W. Bush, compassionate conservative, this yes. sort of the softer, the softer masculinity. Is it to celebrate the fact that we as Christian men have been uncompromising models of integrity and purity? Tragically, no. We have not come to demonstrate our power to influence men. We have come to display our spiritual poverty that Almighty God might influence us. And then, so I miss this like flow of super militant, um, masculine, hardcore that came after that. But that, again, that's not the first time we, we've seen that. We've seen that ebb and flow, even through Billy Graham. I thought it was so interesting at that point in time where they were, where there was a sense of like, the military was a bad place for Christians yeah. to be. Like it was this place of immorality and it was really, but then again, it then it became like a fertile ground for mission work. And then it became this like way too much religion inside the military and sort of this evangelical thrust through that institution. And it's just like, you just see this ebb yes. and flow, ebb and flow back and forth as they, and, and it's right. It is this weird mix of theology and culture, right? Yes. It's not like there's no, especially that the, the sexism mm -hmm. that runs through a lot of this, right? There's some Bible verses being quoted there yes. for real. When I was growing up, even yes. in the promise capers phase. We believe Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. And we believe as men, we have dropped the ball. We have abdicated our roles, and it, we are going before God, and we're asking him to forgive us. That's the reason that we're coming. 
And so you just, there's all this consumerism, theology, especially as expressed towards women, inside this ebb and flow of this militancy, softer masculinity, all of that. It's just so intense. Yeah. I th- one of the things that I really wanted to do is, is to show change over time, that things have not always been the way they are now. And I think that's especially important for evangelicals because evangelicals mm-hmm. tend to speak in terms of, you know, this is God ordained. This is timeless truth. A history, you know, it doesn't mean you can't have timeless truths, but history is going to show you that a lot of the things that you think are timeless and permanent actually are really recent. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's why I went back even to the 19th century briefly in this book to show Show that there was a time when Christians and when evangelicals thought that to be a godly man was to show gentlemanly restraint, right? This is Victorian Christianity. But you had a, a kind of tougher, harsher masculinity, more dominating masculinity in the American South during that time that was embraced by evangelicals. And then in the early 20th century, you have this kind of more unification North and South around muscular Christianity. This is the Teddy Roosevelt era too. But even then, things were different. And so you had liberal Protestants who are as likely to embrace that muscular Christianity as conservatives. In World War I, you were as likely to have liberal Protestants embrace militarism when a lot of conservative Protestants were actually pacifists. Wow. Right, so you just have to go back in time and realize, oh, wow, yeah, as recently as 1940s, as you say, the military was a place where a lot of evangelicals thought that's where boys go to become um, corrupted, right? Lots of bad stuff happening there. And they were right. There was a lot of bad stuff <laughs> happening there, right? You read some of the news reports. And then you can, once you get that in your, in, in your rearview mirror, then you can start realizing, okay, how did our current kind of uh, uh, arrangement. How did this come to be? And the Cold War plays a role there. We're in the Cold War, you know, strong militant manhood was necessary to defend the nation. And evangelicals right on the forefront saying to defend Christian America too. And so you have to defend the country against external threats, but also defend Christianity against internal threats. And this is where mm. we see this culture wars militancy really building, right? And you can trace that through. And even then, you're right, ebbs and flows. 1990s, that's when it, it kind of ebbs. This is when you have, you know, maybe, maybe it's time for a new masculinity. Maybe feminism is here to stay. We need... um We need warriors, sure, but we need tender warriors. And we need leaders, but servant leaders. And patriarchy, sure, but a soft patriarchy, right? And then the pendulum swings again, and we're back into, in the trenches, you don't want tenderness. Well, if you're marketers, you always have to have something to sell, right? It's like how that convinces something's out of style so they can sell the new one. So true. And I will say one thing the Promise Keepers movement did is it created a market for Mm -hmm. men's literature, right? Before then, almost all the the Christian devotional literature, popular Christian books were bought and read by women. And that still is the case, but the 1990s like created kind of men's groups. And what do you you need if you have a men's group? You have to read something, right? It's a vast industry and we should follow the money. Word. That leads me to Tucker Carlson, who, when I hear him... (laughs) Follow the money is an excellent Mm -hmm. transition to Tucker Carlson. (laughs) When I hear him talking about fertility and virility and this very aggressive sexualization of men, (laughs) I have a real men in black experience of that. Like, this must be another life from another galaxy coming here to test us in some way. But I feel like this might be wholly unsurprising to you because you write a lot about sex and about how this subculture has, in very detailed ways, tried to be an educator, an instructor, an indoctrinator around sex. So I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, well, just does Tucker feel like an alien to you, or does this seem like a trajectory that it was that could Can be I anticipated? Choose both? <laughs> yeah, did you go scene by scene through that documentary and be like, let's just take this one, and then you could teach a whole class probably. Oh on that. yeah, where to start with this? Okay, I will say that when we were pitching this book to publishers, right, uh, there were actually Christian publishers who wanted to publish this book on Jesus and John Wayne, and I and I thought, are you sure about that? You know, and they're like, no, no, really. So so we did end up submitting the initial chapters uh, and proposal to at least one Christian publisher. And I found out later that they actually ran into trouble with it because it it triggered their anti-porn kind of software. (laughs) 
Oh, <laughs> and stop. it's because and it's like evangelical's own words, right? Because I'm quoting from evangelical sex manuals. And as you say, they are very explicit here. And yes, so masculinity is also about sex and it also entails uh, all sorts of com- commitments about femininity. So the idea is that God filled with men, uh, men with testosterone. So they have e- the aggression necessary to defend faith, family, and nation and an aggressive sex drive. And so it's up to women to preserve modesty and morality. And also, and they do that by, you know, dressing very modestly. Um, so they don't seduce men who are not their husbands. But if they are married, they have to seduce their husbands. It's all on them. They have to meet their, their husband's profuse sexual needs. And so this is this ideology. It sounds really crass saying it like this, but honestly, you read these books, um, like hundreds of books on how to be a Christian wife, how to have sex as a Christian. This is what you will get over and over again. This is the formula. And so if anything goes wrong, a man steps out of line, there is always a woman to blame, all right? A woman who seduced him, even young girls will be accused of seducing their abusers. Yep. Or often it's the wife, the wife who clearly wasn't meeting his sexual needs. So what could he do? All right. And so this is this really toxic ideology at the heart of, of these, these teachings on gender, on male power and on female submission. And when I read that in the literature, again, I started this research more than 15 years ago. And then over the years, I kind of set the project aside, but I, I still was watching what was going on in these evangelical spaces. And I saw one after another of the men who had been promoting these teachings become implicated in scandals. So sexual abuse, abuse of power. And in the cases of sexual abuse, you could just see this ideology working Mm -hmm. itself out, Uh, not just in terms of the perpetrator, but in terms of uh, victims who are not even able to, to, to counteract this abuse, to call it out, and especially in terms of the communities who had been trained to always defend the man and blame the woman. And just horrifying stories, just so many of them. Yeah. So do you see, because I want to get into to the racial component of all of this, but before we move on from this, as we see the Southern Baptist Convention issuing its investigation, as we see the announcement that the DOJ is investigating the Southern Baptist Convention, do you, do you see change? Do you think this will upend that ideology, or do you think it's just another ebb and flow? I see some change. What I see changing isn't really because of the investigation. Uh, it, it, It was earlier because of the Me Too movement. Mm. And Me Too, and there is a uh, what some have called the Church Two movement, the work of Rachel Den Hollander in particular in, in this respect, really um, I think brought more stories to the surface. And for the first time, some women at least really thought there was a chance that they could be believed. And so I think mm-hmm. that that's probably what we're still seeing here is the surfacing of these stories. When the Southern Baptist Convention released its investigation, um, was it earlier this summer, late in the spring, um, not too long ago, I I was watching that closely, but honestly, it was a little bit frustrating because at this point, <laughs> to still have people responding with shock right. is it's just it's just hard to take, honestly, uh, because. These stories have been out there for a very long time now. I, you know, I wrote Jesus and John Wayne several years ago. Um, you know, four years ago, I was writing it. Uh, it's been out for two and a half years in production for a year. And I had all these stories, right? And I, I had had them for years because I was actually listening to women. And I was tracking these stories and these were credible. And in many cases, they were being prosecuted. And and so these stories were out there to anyone who cared to find them. And Mm -hmm. so at this stage in the game to have, oh, wow, this is going to be a huge turning point. I'm dubious. It will wait and see. What it has done, I think, though, is presented, it's it's no longer possible to really be neutral on this inside mm. the SBC. And so it's exposed some rifts that were already there, I think, between people who are really pushing back, pushing back against the, the sexual abuse investigation and against 
survivors and their advocates. And then kind of the most SBC folks who I would like to think are are trying to do the right thing, but exactly who falls on what side of that line, it's it's it still is in process. Hmm. What is the obstacle to owning up to this abuse and the way it's been handled? What what's the risk of doing the right thing here? Oh, that's a really good question. There are risks. First and foremost, there are financial risks, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, We can talk about litigation. And uh, so now, you know, people like Russell Moore would say that should not be a church's first and foremost concern is, uh, you know, issues of liability. And so there are real divisions there. Um, So that's a very practical obstacle. And then there are the cultural ones and especially the just the the cultivation within many of these evangelical spaces of loyalty to those who hold authority. Uh, so to the pastor, to the father, again, this is patriarchy. And uh, the idea that to be a faithful Christian is to show deference to those that God has appointed over you. And children to parents, women to men, and men to their pastors, and then pastors to more powerful pastors. And that really works against exposing some of uh, these uh, stories. And then there's this idea of, but this is going to hurt the mission of the church, right? Mm -hmm. This is going to tarnish our brand. Again, it's about brand and it's about conversionism. And if you can say, but if if we look bad to those that we're trying to convert, then they're not going to convert and they're going to be damned to all eternity, right? So you can see where this is going and it's justifying the means. So let's just keep the stakes are high. Keep it quiet. Yep. Well, I wonder what you're thinking post-COVID. There's so much writing about pastor burnout, about how people no longer are interested in their pastor's authority if that pastor does not align with their politics or if the pastor is not aligned with their sort of identity inside the Republican Party. Like, I'm just what there are there are moments in COVID where I thought this goes against everything I understand about the evangelical movement with regards to authority, where people were really pushing back on these authority figures. And it's almost like they're being trained through that Donald Trump lens of like being an outsider, fighting back against the elites. And it's like you see this sort of, I mean, do we see any analogy in history of that sort of push back on that sort of authority narrative? Because it feels like that's yeah. really happening right now. Oh, yes. <laughs> Lots of analogies, right? If you if you look at the history of authoritarian populism. Mm. And, and that's an important point that you make that I, I should say deference to authority. Um, but we need an adjective there, deference to God-ordained authority. Mm. And so as soon as you can start to kind of instill doubts or questions, or just outright claim, they are not doing God's work. They are not on our side, by which I mean on God's side, because we're clearly on God's side. God is on our side, right? As soon as you can say they are, if you can put them on the outside, yeah. then no, you do not want to show deference to their authority. Then they are no longer one of us. And so this populist right. element is so strong within American evangelicalism. And I think that caught a lot of leaders off guard. So within the evangelical movement, if you look at kind of MAGA politics, you have a lot of pastors who are all in, Mm -hmm. right? So um, I want to acknowledge that. You also have, and now past tense, had even more evangelical, prominent evangelical voices who were saying, oh, whoa, wait a minute. You know, this is not consistent with our theology or with our beliefs or with who we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus Christ. And look what happened to these folks, you know, Russell Moore out of a job. Uh, uh, you know, look at the kind of attacks get, that get thrown at people like uh, David French. Look at what happened to Beth Moore, for goodness sake. Beth Moore pushed out of the SBC, right? The most powerful 
Southern Baptist woman, arguably the most powerful evangelical woman, she crosses, right, this set of interests. She is very quickly defined out of the fold and pushed out of the fold. So that's the other dynamic that we have to see. So it is incredibly exhausting for pastors right now. I talk with a lot of them all the time, and I have been now for years, and they are torn. Those who aren't like full on, you know, embracing this, this ideology torn because they know they push things too far. They're going to be out of a job, which isn't just their income. Like they can get another job, but it means that they no longer can speak into that community. So I hear a lot of this. Well, I, I, I want to at least still be able to shepherd this flock, but they try to actually do any redirecting and they run into that very harsh opposition and they just have to either be quiet or leave. Yeah. Being quiet doesn't even seem possible to me, though, because my experience of people who strongly identify with this culture is that they are not looking for neutrality. It's Mm -hmm. not that I want a pastor who doesn't speak about politics. Mm -hmm. It's that I want my version of this preached explicitly. And I don't know what you do with that as a pastor. I also don't know what to make of that as a citizen, because in addition to being such powerful marketers, they are such powerful lobbyists, Mm. and not just in using the pulpit to marshal political support, but in secretive, well-funded, behind-the-scenes efforts to control politicians, Supreme Court justices. So I, I wonder what you think. Is it possible that some of the cracks around sexual abuse start to have a domino effect in in exposing more and more of that less than transparent operation. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's why there's so much pushback too uh, against uh, from certain corners of uh, evangelicalism against the exposure. Um, Vicious pushback, I will say too, really targeting survivors and their advocates. And in fact, (laughs) If you want to get a little conspiratorial here, um, actually just looking at the evidence, you can see how in certain pockets of the SBC, for example, this whole anti-CRT movement was just kind of manifested before our eyes, right? You kind of, we saw it happen in real time. Like what? I remember not too long ago, I had to Google, like, what the heck is CRT, right? Mm-hmm. And then within months, I was having speaking invitations canceled because I was a- accused of being a proponent of CRT, right? Like it happened that fast. And so you can see the timeline and who's actually promoting it. The very same people who are trying to quash the sexual abuse stories are the ones who are promoting the anti-CRT movement in tandem. And so, yes, we have to not just look at kind of one facet here, but at this whole picture. Now, in terms of if all pastors have to speak explicitly on this, uh, in many cases, they're going to encounter little resistance if they do. But there are also kind of different ways of understanding what is political and what is not. And Mm. I mean, you'll actually hear a lot of evangelical swear that their pastors are not in any way political. And then I'll go visit their churches and I'll hear their preachers uh, preach against the evils of big government. You know, I'll sit there where I, I hear a prayer thanking God for the anointing of Brett Kavanaugh, but totally not political, right? You know, so, so what, because in, in their mind, this is godly. This is just Christian. This is just what Christians do. This is just obedience. Nothing to see here. So talk to us about that alignment like you said that there it's not just it's not just about masculinity or patriarchy but there is a real white christian nationalism talk to us about when you start to see that rise if there's the same ebb and flow or if that is a steady fuel for this fire yeah when i when i started writing this book i thought it was a book about masculinity and very quickly i realized it was also a book about race And my first clue was that uh, evangelicals just loved their heroes, still do, love their heroes. And and the first document actually that I I started that um, what became this book, I called Hero Worship. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed that all of their heroes, every single one, well, all men and all white men. And then Mm -hmm. uh, not just white men, but often white men who uh, kind of prove their heroism 
by subduing non-white peoples. Uh, mm. you know, so we could talk Teddy Roosevelt and his imperialistic nationalism and um, racism early 20th century, uh, you look at the figure of John Wayne, right? All of his greatest hits. He's the white guy with the gun. He's going to bring order to chaos and he's going to do throw, do so through violence or the threat of violence against non-white populations, Japanese, uh, Mexicans, uh, you know, Native Americans, right? This is just this motif. And once I started to pay attention to that, I came to see. And then, and then historically speaking, if you go back to, I mentioned before this, the Cold War era was really critical to kind of crystallizing this whole worldview. And at that time, um, you have this threat of communism and communism was perceived as anti-God, anti-family and anti-American. And, and it was a legitimate threat, Right legitimate military threat. Um, but then you also see this ideology of kind of rugged, strong masculinity make sense to defend against this threat and um, and to defend Christian America. And there's a pretty much a consensus around this, especially among white Americans. Right? It wasn't just evangelicals who held these values, kind of this was leave it to beaver era, post-World War II, Cold War consensus, right? All on the same page. Again, especially white folks. Um, and then the 60s happen. And that just kind of starts to splinter this. When evangelicals had just kind of moved into the centers of power, this was the, the heyday of Billy Graham in and out of the Eisenhower White House, all their plans to like, let's take back this country. It was going really well. And then 60s, boom, civil rights movement, right? It really threatens the status of white Americans, especially white Southerners, a whole lot of those white Southerners are white evangelicals, right? And and then the feminist movement also and the anti-war movement, like all of these. And the answer to all of the above is the assertion of white patriarchal authority. You can see how evangelicals political mobilization and partisan political mobilization happened in that historical context. So mobilizing to fight back against school desegregation, hugely important. When we hear them talk about, you know, big government is bad, context has to be uh, federal government desegregation efforts. Mm. And when they talk about parental authority, they are not talking about the authority of Black parents to make choices about where their kids go to school, right? And so history is just going to show us that uh, we have to understand the roots of this rhetoric, of this ideology, and then understand how it operates today. I feel like Billy Graham had the best publicist on earth. Like, <laughs> I just... I was really struck reading about him in this book versus the image of Billy Graham that I grew up with. Reverend William Billy Graham's untiring evangelism has spread the word of God to every corner of the globe and made him one of the most inspirational spiritual leaders of the 20th century. As a deeply committed Christian, his challenge to accept Jesus Christ has lifted the hearts, assuaged the sorrows, and renewed the hopes of millions. Billy Graham is an American who lives first and always or his fellow citizens. And I am so curious to just continue to kind of unpack like where my version, and I would say the same about James Dobson. Like they both have been presented to me as, and I would say as a child of the early 1980s, they both present were presented to me as like gentle grandfatherly spiritual guides can do no wrong. For over 40 years, Dr. James Dobson has been working to support the institution of the family. During that time, he's authored over 30 books, written hundreds of articles, broadcast thousands of radio shows, and produced many videos and films. And to see them in such overtly political terms was pretty jarring. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I, I grew up in a Christian home, but not one that was at the center of evangelicalism. I come from a little Dutch immigrant culture, reformed tradition. And so I was exposed to some of this, but I did not grow up in a home where Billy Graham was idolized by any stretch. He was pretty much irrelevant. That not our guy, not our tradition. Uh, and James Dobson also viewed with some skepticism, although, you know, listen to Christian radio and James Dobson comes on every day. So, you know, part of our, of my upbringing, but not, not at the center. And so honestly, I really learned about Billy Graham by reading history books about Billy Graham. And so I was actually caught off guard 
by the response of so many evangelicals to Jesus and John Wayne, particularly around the issue of Billy Graham. Uh, first, I got some real pushback, but mostly I got kind of your response of how, how did I miss this? How could I not have known that this is Billy Graham? And, and then, you know, so I've become this, this historian that's kind of debunked the Billy Graham myth when in fact I am not, I'm just copying what other historians have been saying for decades, mm. right? All of that, none of that was archival research on my part. I was just taking the the most solid peer-reviewed scholarship and working with it. And that's, so I didn't understand quite how shocking it was going to be to evangelicals. But I came to understand that evangelicals have controlled their own narratives so Mm. effectively. They write their own histories. They write their own stories and they punish those who say, actually, <laughs> there's a different different story here. You're missing some of this and you're shamed. And, you know, I've been called out, I don't know how many times for not being nice, being too critical, uh, not saying enough nice things about these evangelicals. I'm like, look, if I'm going to be writing a book on evangelical masculinity and militarism and why it matters for American democracy, there's just a little bit more bad than good. <laughs> there's not a lot of nice things to say, guys. Right, I'm sorry. This is where I end up. But, you know, I could write another story about another, another aspect of evangelicalism, and maybe there'd be more nice things in it. But whether we write our nice stories or our, our, our more critical stories, the key is for historians, how do all these stories come together? How is it that the same people are giving money to charity and, and to missions and are, are seem like such nice people and are such nice people when you visit their church on a Sunday and also supporting these policies and uh, ideologies that are doing great harm? And I think that's where the question really has to be. Well, and Billy Graham was a marketer, too, right? He made a choice Fabulous. in those moments in the 60s to say, OK, well, where is our our customer base? Oh, and yeah. here's what I've been dying to ask you. Okay, well, considering all this history of white Christian nationalism, there's all this reporting right now. I even read an article quoting one of your co-workers at Calvin, Mark Mulder, about Latino Protestants in America, that Latinos are in huge numbers converting from Catholicism to evangelical Protestantism. And so I'm like, okay, well, what y'all going to do now? Because you like a growing customer base. You really do. And you have one. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be in direct direct conflict to a lot of this white Christian nationalism. And so what's going to happen next? So the thing is, uh, sorry to to have to tell you this, the conversions that we see among Hispanic Christians into evangelicalism are not necessarily in conflict with this white Christian nationalism. Mm. Uh, If you're looking at racial differences, certainly in black Protestant, even black quote unquote evangelical circles, although those are very small because most black Christians who hold to these theological beliefs, right, I do not identify as evangelical because it's super clear to them there's a whole lot more going on than just these Mm -hmm. theological points. But if we look at Hispanic uh, evangelicals, uh, that's where you see much closer overlap between white uh, evangelicalism and Christian nationalism and uh, their own beliefs. And I, I've, I, I was watching this trend as I was writing Jesus and John Wayne. And I think, you know, one plausible explanation is they, they have a common commitment to patriarchy, this kind of mm-hmm. cultural machismo that they're coming from. And then we, who are we talking about in terms of Hispanic Americans, even that there are so there's such diversity within that category. Yeah. Um, some of these Hispanic folks identify as white. We're looking at different immigrant cultures or uh, just so many differences within that demographic category that in fact, um, when you look at uh signs of embrace of Christian nationalism and what goes hand in hand with that support of Trump, much higher numbers in Hispanic Christian spaces than we would see, for instance, in African-American spaces. Interesting. Hmm. There are obviously layers and layers that we could talk about with respect to the Dobbs decision, the decision explicitly overturning Roe versus Wade. I wonder as a researcher around gender and evangelicalism, What interests you most about what could come of this decision? I've long been curious about claims that, you know, up until now, that Republicans were never going to actually push for the overturn of Roe because uh, it was so useful to them politically to keep holding that out there. And claims that, you know, we we do know that uh, fairly significant numbers of evangelicals have had abortions. And so 
you now we're kind of moving from the rhetorical phase, if you will, uh, into living with this decision. And so I'm really curious to see how that will play out in evangelical spaces. Because for a long time, I mean, we saw here too, change over time. In the 60s, you can go back and read cover story in Christianity today. You know, abortion, good or bad. Answer, oh, it's really complicated. Right? You just don't, you're not going to get that today. The Southern Baptist Convention, well into the 1970s, pro-choice, official platform, pro-choice, right? Which isn't to say that anti-abortion is anything new in American Christianity, in Christian history more widely, or in American evangelicalism, but there was more nuance. Mm -hmm. And that, that nuance in our lifetimes, in evangelical spaces, was largely squeezed out. You know, so I certainly grew up that, you know, life begins at yep. conception and pro-life equals Christian and everybody else is, you know, of the enemy, really. Mm -hmm. And so much so that honestly, even just a few months ago or in the last year or two, when some Republican politicians would kind of slip up and say, yes, women ought to be prosecuted and a whole bunch of the pro-life leaders and you know, movement were like, oh no, we don't go that far, right? And I was like, don't you though? <laughs> because, you know, I thought you said it was murder. And, and I didn't realize actually that you wouldn't take it to that logical extreme, mm -hmm. right? And so honestly, for me as a researcher who's who studied this, who's watched this, who's lived this, I'm just watching so closely to, to see exactly what you asked, what, what does happen next? And so much is up in the air right now. I'm really curious to see what the next year or two is going to going to bring well, I think it's just like what you articulated about the Southern Baptist Convention, that you start, it exposed the conflict. It exposes some of the disagreements and exposes some of the alignments yes. that were under the surface in a, in a really clear way, especially as every state starts to really get into the weeds of like South Carolina. Are we going to do a total ban? Are we going to do a complete and total abortion ban? And you start to see, well, who's here for the... Who's here for the righteousness, the theology? I'm going to use the word theology there pretty loosely. But mm -hmm. who's there for the righteous cause and who's here for the politics and whether it's good politics or not? Because I think that's what yes. you're seeing immediately is who for this was good politics. And when it stops being good politics, they have some questions. And who was here for other reasons? And look, I think that you have both groups inside evangelical. Oh, absolutely. So who's scrubbing their websites now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're really stark uh, anti-abortion rhetoric. Uh, who's who's foregrounding that? I just saw uh, a piece uh, put out by Family Research Council yesterday or today uh, where they were saying that you know, there is never a scenario I in which that. abortion can save the life of a mother. <laughs> you know, it's a whole bunch of medical professionals like, excuse me. Yes. You know, False. where, how do you say this? How do you do this? So, so you're absolutely seeing um, the tensions within. I feel like Dobbs is an excellent transition to your next book that we want to just announce quickly. You guys, if you, I met with Kristen a few months ago and she told me the title. <laughs> I made her stop. I was like, stop. I need a moment. I need to just soak in the joy I feel at the title of this book that I think is so perfect. Tell, tell the people, tell them, don't make them wait another second. It is called Live, Laugh, Love. Yeah. I can't. I can't. Don't have the subtitle yet, but it is a cultural history of white Christian womanhood. And I'm guessing probably 90 some percent of your listeners could probably outline the chapters, right? Yeah, right they with could. That. Yeah. yeah. Do, would you want, would that help you at this point? Would you like some submissions? Yeah. Just, uh... <laughs> Honestly, when I first posted this, uh, you know, this is my next book. And I just saw the response on Twitter was overwhelming. And I was so impressed. Like, yeah, we're doing Christian romance and we're doing CCM. And of course, we're doing Amy Grant. And yes, Amy. we're doing MLMs and we're doing Hallmark <laughs> movies. We're doing it all. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, we might need to reserve a little more time when that book comes out. I would say probably three to five hours should do it. Maybe a two-parter. Absolutely. Two -parter. Maybe Absolutely. a couple series. Like a series. Probably a series. Yeah. Yeah, I think a series. Oh, my Lord. I'm so excited.
Because that's the thing. It's like you're reading Jesus and John Wayne the whole time. You're like, oh, but the other side of this, the other side of this is so— I felt that writing it. Yep. Oh, my gosh. And I want to ask you about that because if you look at Twitter, it looks to me like a lot of white men's reaction to your book has been negative. (laughs) Oh, Lord. This is a podcast, but I'm rolling my eyes so hard right now, just so y'all know. And a lot of white women's reaction has been like, oh, my God, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. And a lot of people of color have said, like, right, yeah, <laughs> like we said this too. Yeah, like you, nothing you, yes, new correct. here, but thank you for saying it. Yes. 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 Is that, you know, Twitter is not real life, I'm aware. So mm-hmm. it, how does that track your real reception of this book? Because you do talk a lot about how instrumental evangelical women were mm-hmm. to creating mm-hmm. this myth mm-hmm. of masculinity. So what what has the response been like from that group? Yes, I love talking about this. Uh, First, let me say that, don't be fooled, the very loud voices on Twitter of certain conservative white evangelical men, particularly those invested in white evangelical power structures that I am critiquing, and I could name names if needed, all right, that they are... (laughs) Actually, not the majority in terms of certainly not the feedback I get. I have literally gotten thousands of letters now from readers, but thousands, like I think we're at 2000 probably, right? You know, messages since two days after the book release, I started getting the first letters coming in. Mm. And more than half of these are from white evangelical men who are saying, thank you. Thank you. This is the story of my life. And thank you for helping me to see. And I have conservative, complementarian PCA pastors who are big supporters, right? I've got SBC pastors, big supporters. This is kind of opening up a divide within those spaces. Mm -hmm. So don't be fooled. Yes, I do take on, you know, we might refer to as the Theo bros. <laughs> and and it is it is honestly kind of fun for me as a historian. Up until this project, everybody I had written about had been dead for like a century <laughs> or more. And so these guys are like there. You could just tweet at them and then, ta-da, you have more evidence. And, and it's kind <laughs> of fun. I love today how someone called you humorless and you were like, no, that's too far. <laughs> well, they, like, they called me humorous and they accused me of castrating uh, most American men. So I did draw wow. the line of saying I was not humorous. Wow. Right. So, you know, yeah, it is. It, I do like being on Twitter. Um, but among uh, evangelical women, a lot of women who are on Twitter, again, it, it, Twitter is not an accurate reflection of reality. <laughs> Probably a good thing. I know there are women, who, obviously, like you, you don't have this kind of patriarchal system persist for so long without a whole lot of buy in from women. Yep. Uh, and yep. so, yes, that'll be part of Live, Laugh, Love. But there are also many women who are just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping me see, for helping me escape, for helping me know that this was not just me, right? And that I wasn't the crazy one here. And it's just really affirming to see, especially I've heard from a number of survivors of sexual Mm -hmm. abuse who say that having their story, either actually their personal story or representative story, part of the historical record now makes a huge difference, right? Mm. They aren't just on the fringes. They aren't just kind of forgotten. Their story matters and their story, as awful as it was, is now part of the historical record. Well, thank you for your work. Again, reserve three, approximately three to five hours for part one (laughs) on your second book. (laughs) So we'll have you back then. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm a big fan. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much to Kristen. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. We will be back in your ears, but a day later, we will be back in your ears on Wednesday of next week because of Indigenous Peoples Day, which is a federal holiday on Monday. We can't wait to hear from everyone then. And until then, keep it nuanced, y'all. Pantsuit Politics is produced by Studio D Podcast Production. Elise Knapp is our managing director. Maggie Penton is our community engagement manager. Dante Lima is the composer and performer of our theme music. Our show is listener supported. Special thanks to our executive producers. Martha Brunitsky. Linda Daniel. Allie Edwards. Janice Elliott. Sarah Greenup. Julie Haller. Helen Handley. Tiffany Hassler. Emily Holliday. Katie Johnson. Katina Zuganellis Kasling. Barry Kaufman. Molly Kors. Lori Lodow. Lily McClure. Emily Neasley. The Hedgehog!
Wins. Tawny Peterson. Tracy Putoff. Sarah Ralph. Jeremy Sequoia. Katie Steigers. Karen True. Annika Uveline. Nick and Elisa Valelli. Catherine Vollmer. Amy Whited. Jeff Davis. Melinda Johnston. Michelle Wood. Joshua Allen. Morgan McHugh. Nicole Berkley.